we'll just give it a moment for the attendees all to, to enter the room. There we go. Okay, I think we have a full house. So good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon even. Um, I'm Adrian McConnell, I'm uh, Head of Charity at the CO Research Trust, um, and welcome to the second of our lecture series. I'm very pleased this afternoon to be joined by Beth Cheshire from Lancaster University, who has been undertaking for the last three years a PhD funded by the CO Research Trust looking at um, the effects of CO upon older people. Um, before we get going, just a few house rules. Um, Beth is going to um, show her presentation as a pre-recorded um, set of slides. Because of the size of the file, the, the presentation is split into two. So there will be a quick pause while she switches files. Um, if you have any questions for Beth, could I ask that you put them in the the, the chat function at the bottom of the uh, screen. And what we'll do at the end is um, we'll go through those questions and I'll unmute you so you can ask them directly to Beth and she can reply. Um, I'm quite conscious that we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So enough from me, um, I'm gonna hand over to Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thank you for joining us today for the second lecture of the series on the impact of CO on older adults. My name is Beth Cheshire and I'm going to be presenting the findings of the research that I've been carrying out for the past three and a half years at Lancaster University. Just before we start, I'd like to thank the CO Research Trust for the opportunity to present the research findings today and for funding and supporting the project. This is an overview of the planned presentation. So today I'm going to be presenting both the cross-sectional and longitudinal findings from the research. But first, I'm just going to go through a brief background, followed by the research aims and the methods that we use, and then the results and research directions moving forward. So the majority of research studies severe acute CO poisoning, and the effects of these exposures are well described. However, studies on low level exposure are limited and any resulting effects are currently unknown. There has been a few experimental studies on acute low level exposures, so durations up to 24 hours. And these studies have typically exposed individuals to around 100 parts per million for short durations, usually between one and four hours. The researchers would put participants into a chamber filled with low level CO or have them breathe the CO through a face mask and then get them to carry out some form of cognitive testing. And what these studies have revealed are that small increases in carboxyhemoglobin levels up to around 5% are associated with cognitive deficits, such as impaired tracking ability and divided attention. However, as you can see from the pictures, these studies are very old, with the majority carried out over four decades ago. Other acute experimental studies have reported no effects of these exposures, but the literature is also somewhat inconsistent. So moving on to chronic exposure, there are numerous case reports within the literature that typically describe an individual's exposure experience. However, one in particular was a case series that followed seven individuals who were exposed to CO within the home from malfunctioning domestic appliances. And the exposure periods ranged from three weeks to three years duration. And what they reported were consistent symptoms in all seven individuals, 
including headaches and nausea. Affective disorders were also high, including depression and anxiety. And those psychological testing revealed memory impairments and motor slowing in all seven individuals as well. Now, follow-up testing revealed improvements in some symptoms and in cognitive functioning, with some patients making a full recovery. However, mild deficits such as slow processing speed remained in some cases, and symptoms such as psychiatric problems commonly persisted. So the effects associated with chronic exposures may be persistent in nature rather than short-lasting. In some cases, complete recovery is achieved. However, symptoms and cognitive impairment can remain. And these can range in severity from mild to severe. These deficits can prevent individuals from making a full recovery. So they do contribute to significant morbidity. And they shouldn't be overlooked as they can significantly impact the lives of patients and families longer term. So epidemiology studies also provide evidence of the effects associated with chronic exposures, with reported associations between air pollution and increased risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, and heart failure. And this is indicated by increased hospital admission and mortality rates in areas of high pollution. An association between increased dementia development risk, development risk and CO has also been reported. And air pollution has recently been identified as a dementia development risk factor in later life. So taken together, the results of these studies suggest that neuropsychological deficits may present following these less severe exposures and that they also may be persistent in nature. So we know that certain groups within the population may be at a higher risk of CO exposure. The research I've been carrying out has studied an older adult sample. As we know, as a group, they may be more susceptible to CO. But what is it in severity not only depends on environmental factors, such as the duration and concentration, but also human factors as well, such as pre-existing disease. So individuals with, for example, cardiac conditions or respiratory conditions, such as COPD, are likely to be more susceptible, susceptible to raise carboxyhemoglobin levels and develop severe toxicity from lower concentrations. And this is due to the already compromised ability to adequately regulate and maintain oxygen supply. The carboxyhemoglobin level at which more severe symptoms become apparent is dependent upon the individual's ability to compensate for the decrease in oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So the very young and older adults at the highest risk of accidental CO exposure, and older adults of the group may also be more susceptible to the effects of CO not only due to pre-existing disease, but also reduced physiological reserve. They also may be at high risk from exposure within the home, as they're likely to spend more time at home due to retirement or restricted mobility, and they may also be housebound. So moving on to CO levels within the home, there has been a few studies that have measured the ambient CO concentrations within UK homes. And what they've reported is that in some of the homes, the ambient CO levels exceeded those recommended to be safe by the World Health Organization. And two of these studies in particular found that of the 326 monitored homes, 19% had levels exceeded the eight hour guideline of nine parts per million. And the elevated levels were frequently associated with gas appliances. This may be a particular concern within the UK as gas appliances are widely used for heating and cooking and homes are often older and therefore they're more likely to contain dated appliances. However, other studies monitoring CO levels have found no evidence of raised concentrations. So again, the literature is somewhat inconsistent. But nevertheless, the results of these studies taken together suggest that a percentage of the population that may be at risk from low level exposures at higher levels than those recommended to be safe. So this could be having a detrimental effect on health. Individuals also might be unaware of the exposure and this leads to your chronic prolonged exposures. 
But currently it is unclear as to whether these exposures can cause short-term or have long-lasting effects on the brain. So re further research in this area is needed. The research was developed from initial concerns from the fire service, who often report high levels of confusion in older adults who may be at risk of CO exposure at levels not sufficient to trigger a CO alarm, but that could still be harmful to health. So it's possible that these exposures may therefore be an unidentified cause of cognitive impairment that improved identification and awareness could prevent. The research examined the proportion of older adult homes in Coventry that had low level CO in the air and the resulting neuropsychological effects. Follow up testing was also carried out at seven months, and this was to enable the examination of both the short term and longer term impacts of these exposures on cognitive function and health. And additionally, the relationship between CO exposure and age um, on neuropsychological function was explored. So this is an overview of how the participants were recruited onto the study and the overall procedure. So the fire service invited residents who were aged 60 and above to take part in the study during their routine safe and well visits. Those who indicated that they were interested were then revisited by the fire service, and this was the point at which the data loggers and alarms were put in place. The fire service also carried out the first phase of a two-stage consent process, where residents agreed for their details to be shared with and to be contacted by the researcher. Home visits were then scheduled, where full written consent and neuropsychological testing was carried out. And then the fire service collected the data loggers after one month, the files for safety and then shared them and I combined them with the health data ready for analysis and this process was then repeated at the seven month follow-up. So we collected a lot of information including general information relating to the property type, the appliances and behaviour within the home but also health data including physical and psychiatric diagnoses. Levels of CO in exhaled breath were also taken and a range of neuropsychological assessments were carried out, examining different types of memory, attention, and executive functioning. Affective disorders, including anxiety and depression, were also examined. One of the main aspects of the research was to develop a CO outcome measure that could be used in the analysis with the neuropsychological data. Usually you would use a measure of central tendencies such as the mean. However, many of the properties had a large number of zero readings, and so the mean for many of these properties was around zero. However, the graphical representation of the data presented a different picture. So I've included the CO readings from two of the properties, and we can see that figure one shows a continuous extremely low level exposure with the majority of readings over the month between 0.5 and 2.5 parts per million, with very few zero readings, whereas figure two shows a completely different exposure pattern with the majority of readings at zero, but then with these short lasting high peaks. So using a measure such as the mean was not an accurate representation of the data, so we needed to develop a measure that could analyze the different exposure levels separately. So firstly, ranges were developed and these were based both on the range within the collected data and the World Health Organization guidelines. As the highest peak in the data was 29 parts per million, the two lowest guidelines were focused on of 6 and 9 parts per million, with lower ranges also incorporated to include the lower CO reading. So many CO measures were then developed and considered with a percentage of readings between specified ranges chosen for the analysis. And this was because it showed the most reliable results and also permitted the inclusion of zero readings in the analysis. So over the four weeks, there was a total of around 8,000 readings. And of these, the amount that fell within each CO range was calculated and converted to a percentage. And then each CO range was analysed separately. 
It was anticipated that this data analysis method combined with detailed neuropsychological data would not only provide evidence of the effects of chronic exposure, but importantly, contribute towards determining the threshold that detrimental effects occur. Of the total 106 homes, 70 had some CO present over the initial one month monitoring period. The data was analysed using regression models. So, firstly, factors that are known to affect cognition, such as age, pre morbid IQ, pre existing physical diagnoses. These were firstly controlled for so that the levels of variance associated with these factors was accounted for. The percentages of CO were then added to the model in order to determine whether the exposure to CO contributed towards the explained variance. The results revealed that chronic exposure to extremely low level CO may be associated with slightly higher performance on a range of cognitive tasks including auditory and visual working memory, memory recognition, effective attention, visual spatial ability and planning and problem solving. These exposures appear to have slightly positive effects on cognition. It is important to note that the CO levels within the data were extremely low with the mean CO level of 0.09 parts per million and the resulting carboxyhemoglobin levels of the participants at 0.7%. They were extremely low. So why would these exposures be having a potentially positive effect on cognition? And the beneficial effects of endogenous CO have long been described in the literature. So we do produce small amounts of CO from normal physiological processes. So when the body breaks down red blood cells, CO results as a byproduct. It has been identified as a neurotransmitter and is involved in various cellular functions such as vasodilation and proliferation. It plays a role, a vital role in cellular maintenance, protection and survival. Now, due to its physiologic and cytoprotective properties, the administration of low-level CO for neuroprotection is being explored for therapeutic use and it may benefit patients with traumatic brain injury, stroke or epilepsy. The view of the central of CO and its effects on the central nervous system have typically been negative. However, endogenous CO is crucial, crucial for normal brain function, yet it is also so potentially toxic and this is dependent upon the dose and duration. These physiological processes combined with adaptation, tolerance and compensatory mechanisms potentially minimise risk to the central nervous system under low-level chronic exposure conditions. They play in a protective or even beneficial role up to a certain dose and duration. For example, endogenous CO plays a, a role in the regulation of vascular tone in resistant vessels acting as a vasodilator in cerebral and systemic circulation. So the vasoactive properties of CO may also result from exposure to low level inhaled CO, which may play a protective role to cognitive functioning by increasing, temporarily increasing and maintaining cerebral blood flow. And this may be of particular benefit to older adults due to the vascular and cerebral changes associated with aging, but also to ischemic sensitive brain areas such as the hippocampus, the basal ganglia, prefrontal cortex, cortex and cerebral white matter. These brain areas are associated with cognitive functions similar to the pattern of performance improvements reported including working memory, memory recognition, and executive functioning. So the temporary increases in cerebral blood flow that may be associated with low-level CO exposure may explain the pattern findings. 
Of the 106 participants that took part, 78 completed the follow-up at seven months. And of the 78 homes, 47% had some PO present. These results indicate, as a both study, a high prevalence of low-level CO within older adult homes in Coventry. However, the CO levels did not exceed those currently recommended to be safe by the World Health Organization in any home. The results from the one-month exposure at time two again revealed positive CO-related effects in areas of divided attention, process to feed, visual working memory, planning and problem solving, so across a range of cognitive abilities. Positive long-term effects were also related to the exposure at time one in areas of planning and problem solving at seven months. Examination of the longer term impacts of the exposure from time one on neuropsychological function at seven months also revealed negative exposure ex effects in areas of long term memory, specifically recognition, reaction time, individual variability, reflective attention, and near significant effects in short term memory. The negative effects were also related to the exposure at time two as well. That in auditory working memory and cognitive flexibility and inhibition. For the total CO exposure over both monitoring periods was also examined to investigate the direction of effects associated with the overall exposure. And we found positive CO related effects of the total exposure on visual working memory and planning and problem solving. However, the positive effects of the total exposure were observed on these two areas of cognition only. Overall negative effects of the total exposure were observed across a wider range of cognitive functions, including cognitive flexibility and inhibition, auditory working memory, and selective attention. So overall, negative effect, effects were present across a range of cognitive functions compared to the um, positive effects only related to two of these areas of cognition. The remaining positive exposure effects observed in the cross-sectional study um, in areas of memory recognition, selective attention, and auditory working memory were also not present at follow-up. Instead, negative CO-related effects were observed in all three areas of cognition. The results provide evidence that these exposures are related to beneficial and potentially short-lasting effects on particular cognitive functions. The most notable of these were the effects on visual spatial ability and problem solving, planning and visual working memory. And when considering the results from the cross-sectional and longitudinal studies together, replication effects were present in these areas as well. So this adds further support to the positive effects in these domains. And additionally, none of these areas were associated with any negative effects in any of the analyses, and they were associated with the total scale exposure as well. This suggests that certain areas of cognition may potentially benefit from low-level CO exposure. However, the results also suggest that the longer term impact of exposure to CO is associated with negative effects um, on cognitive function at seven months. The most consistent negative findings were observed in memory recognition, reaction time variability and selective attention, and the negative impact on auditory working memory, cognitive flexibility and inhibition that were observed in the short term post the exposure at time two. Again, positive effects were not observed on um, in any of the analysis on any of these cognitive functionings, and the total exposure was also um, associated with them as well. So this suggests um, it indicates an overall detrimental impact of exposure on these functions. 
there was a relatively consistent pattern um, of results by, whereby short um, positive effects were observed and longer term negative impacts. So negative impacts potentially follow the positive effects observed in the relatively short period um, post exposure. And this further supports the idea that particular areas of function may benefit more from and, and others more vulnerable to CO exposure. The examination of the interaction effects between the CO exposure and age on domains of cognitive functioning revealed that the effects of age um, on particular cognitive functions, including many aspects of memory and processing speed, um, it, it, these relationships are moderated by CO exposure. So the negative relationship between age and these areas of, of cognition would strengthen um, when exposed to higher levels of CO. And this was a relatively consistent finding across um, the CO ranges for all of these domains. So just to um, explain this interaction in more detail, I've included a few graphical representations um, so the first, um, firstly, I presented the relationship between age and cell making B scores. Um, so this task measures cognitive flexibility and inhibition, and higher scores actually represent poorer performance. So the relationship between age and cognitive flexibility and inhibition is positive, um, in that the scores increase with increase in age. So although the correlation is positive, the effect of age on these functions is actually negative due to the higher scores representing poorer performance. So if we take the square root of the R squared linear, um, which is 0.249, we can examine the strength of this relationship. So the correlation coefficient for this relationship between age and cognitive flexibility and inhibition is 0.5, so a moderate to strong relationship, which you would expect. So poorer performance is associated with increasing age. So now if we have a look at the relationship um, including CO exposure, um, the, the exposure has been separated into two groups, those that had no to low CO, um, percentage of CO between 0.5 and 3 parts million. And these are represented by the blue data points and those with high percentages of reading, which are represented by the red points. So we can see that the negative regression effects are still present with increasing age related to poorer, poorer performance scores. The trend of this relationship, however, changes as a, fun as a function of CO exposure. So if we first look at the strength of the relationship between the lower CO group, we can see that it's 0.4. So it's actually decreased um, for those individuals who had low exposure. Whereas the correlation coefficient for the higher group is 0.64. So this is telling us that the relationship between age and cognitive flexibility and inhibition, inhibition changes based on whether an individual is, is exposed to high or low CO. The high, the high levels of CO strengthen the negative relationship between age and cognition. So the decline is greater when exposed to higher levels of CO. I've also included another example examining the effects of CO on the relationship between age and delayed memory recall. So again, the relationship between age and memory recall is negative in that the scores decrease with increase in age. The direction of the effect is the same as on the last slide. The only difference is that lower scores represent poorer performance on this task. The correlate, correlation coefficient between age and delayed recall is 0.41. So increase in age is associated with lower recall scores, which is what we would expect. When the CO exposure is included, again, separated into two groups, um, with no to low CO represented by the blue data points and higher CO, the red points, we can see that the strength of the relationship between age and memory recall, again, changes as a function of CO exposure. So the strength of the effect in the low CO group and age um, on memory is 0.16. 
But the correlation for the high CA group is again stronger than the association between age and memory alone. So it was 0.41 between memory and age and when CO exposure, high CO exposure is also considered, the relationship is stronger at 0.59. This high levels of CO is strengthening this negative relationship between age and memory. The key findings of the study, of both studies, suggest that the impact of exposure to chronic low level CO is associated with slight improvements in certain areas of cognitive function. However, the majority of these effects were short lasting, with longer term negative impacts observed on cognitive function at seven months. The results also indicate that some areas of cognition may potentially benefit more from low level CO exposure in the short term and that others may be more susceptible. So why some cognitive functions are perhaps more vulnerable to low-level CO exposure and others potentially benefit is currently unknown. The sensitivity of specific brain regions to ischemia insult, as mentioned previously, may possibly provide an explanation for the findings reported in both studies. These areas include the hippocampus, the basal ganglia and cerebral white matter and damage to the white matter is particularly detrimental to the frontal lobes. So these brain areas are associated with the cognitive functions, um, the similar pattern effects observed in both studies, and a range of executive functioning and working memory and mental recognition. So these brain regions and their associated cognitive functions may benefit most from the vasoactive properties of the CO and subsequent potential CO-related temporary increases in cerebral blood flow. The low level exposure may play a protective and possibly beneficial role up to a certain dose and duration. And this may be particularly beneficial to these ischemic sensitive brain regions, which may result in slightly improved function in the cognitive areas they are associated with. And this effect may be present in older adults only due to the structural and functional changes to the vasculature that are associated with aging and disease, but however, currently this is unknown. So the protective properties of low-level CO, if present, are likely to be transient with carboxyhemoglobin accumulation over time and the stress this places on the body's physiological resources, reaching a, a point where the body can no longer compensate for uptake of CO and subsequently insufficient cerebral blood flow and ischemia may follow. Now these brain areas are likely to be areas most susceptible to damage um, when physiological, physiological responses can no longer compensate for the continuous accumulation of carboxyhemoglobin. Evidence in support of this is provided by the shift from short lasting beneficial effects to longer term negative effects in areas of memory recognition, protective attention at, se at seven months, and the change from positive to negative effects on auditory working memory that became apparent in the short term following the second exposure period. Older adults again are likely to be more vulnerable to the negative effects of CO. due to the structural and functional changes associated with aging and disease. So endothelium dependent vasodilation and cerebral blood flow are known to decline in healthy aging in the absence of cardiovascular disease. And moreover, the, the age-related structural changes to the blood vessels can lead to impaired vessel function, including endothelial dysfunction, arterial stiffness, and hyperperfusion. And this can result in vascular dysfunction. And these age-related alterations in the vasculature can lead to suboptimal cerebral blood flow and hypoperfusion, which have been identified as precursors for mild impairment and have been reported to, reported to accurately predict the development of Alzheimer's disease. 
And furthermore, cardiovascular risk factors such as heart failure and hypertension, atrial fibrillation are more common in older adults and lead to greater decreases in cerebral blood flow and chronic hyperfusion. And this further compromises the already reduced cerebral blood flow that is present in aging. So the joint effect of these structural and functional changes on blood flow can result in a neuronal energy crisis. And this is followed by neuronal dysfunction and death. And this can contribute to and increase the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And this process is initiated in ischemic sensitive zones such as the hipp hippocampus and white matter. But prolonged hypofusion can then gradually, gradually spread to other more ischemic resistant brain regions, leading to neuronal death in these areas, which can result in further cognitive impairment and eventual dementia. Now, carboxyhemoglobin accumulation over time may add to the burden of already compromised cerebral blood flow in older adults. And this may further increase the risk of early cognitive decline and dementia. However, currently this is unknown. So if we are to move forwards towards identifying safe levels of, of exposure, then the detailed analysis of CO data over time and how these correlate with how the health outcome is needed. So the previous reports monitoring CO levels within UK homes provide data on the magnitude of the problem, they offer invaluable insight into the number of individuals at risk from low level exposures and the types of properties and appliances that present the highest risk. They also highlight geographical and socioeconomic factors that likely affect exposure vulnerability. And from this, interventions can be directed to those most vulnerable in society. However, they typically lack uh, occupant health status information and therefore any resulting exposure effects are not examined. Acute experimental studies typically include small sample sizes of healthy predominantly male young adults who have maximal physiological reserves and are therefore least likely to show any adverse effects on the central nervous system. They also had poor design and control measures they were an ethical and carried out over 40 years ago. They also focused on the short term effects without longitudinal follow up with patients, and so any longer term impacts were not examined. Case reports of chronic exposure are based on an individual's experience, which makes generalizations at the population level problematic, and they often lack exposure information related to the concentration and exposure duration which makes determining the degree of exposure difficult. Epidemiology studies also provide insight into outdoor low-level chronic exposures at the population level, but they do not offer detailed health information at the individual level. <clears throat> so the analysis methods outlined here uh, with CO data examined in specified ranges permits any resulting effects to be investigated at different levels. And this combined with the detailed neuropsychological and health data would make a huge contribution towards determining the threshold at which low level CO exposure becomes harmful. Now these thresholds are likely to be different dependent not only on the exposure duration, but also individual differences in the population of the city. Now identifying safe exposure levels is vital for both healthy and successful individuals if we are to move towards keeping the public safe. So the research presented here contributes towards determining these thresholds, with results indicating that at least four weeks of exposure, up to 29 parts per million, is associated with positive effects on different aspects of cognition. However, the longer term impact of air exposure between 0.5 to 25 parts per million at seven months was associated with negative impacts on um, a range of cognitive functions also. And auditory working memory, uh, cognitive flexibility and inhibition were found to uh, be negatively impacted by the shorter term exposure at time two. So, uh, one of the most concerning findings of the research is that the negative is the negative impact of advancing age on specific cognitive functions. 
that, that this may be moderated by a level CO, whereby the cognitive decline associated with ageing is potentially accelerated by low level CO exposure in areas of long term memory, processing speed, and cognitive flexibility and inhibition. Now, this is um, an alarming finding given that um, the, you know, there's been a lot of research recently between the examining the link between CO exposure and dementia development risk. This area has gained um, a lot of attention over the last decade. Two rep retrospective studies um, examined the association between dementia development risk and CO poisoning. And what they reported was the overall incident rate of dementia was higher in CO poisoned patients than in the non poisoned patients. And this indicates that CO poisoned patients are at a high risk of developing dementia. Evidence of the relationship between chronic low level exposure and dementia development is provided by epidemiology studies with reported associations between air pollution, including CO, and increased dementia risk. And further support of the detrimental effects associated with low level exposures um, is presented in a case report of two patients that were chronically exposed to CO. Um, from coal-based heating appliances over the course of several years. And neuropsychological impairments were observed in memory and attention. And blood analysis revealed slightly raised carboxyl globin levels. Now, following discontinuation of heaters, subsequent uh, post-exposure follow-ups revealed a normalization of carboxyl globin levels, a resolution of symptoms, and improvements in cognitive functioning. So that, therefore, the observed impairments may be associated with chronic low-level CO exposure. Additionally, the brain abnormalities observed in CO poisoned patients include those um, that are sensitive to ischemia insults with lesions to the globus um, pallidus and atrophy of the hippocampus and white matter hyperintensity is commonly reported. White matter um, Hyperintensities and atrophy of the hippocampus are also associated with aging and are related to increased risks of early cognitive decline and dementia. But whether the observed uh, effects of chronic exposures on cognition are long lasting or can lead to similar damage is, is unknown. Um, evidence from the same case report that I've just mentioned. Um, revealed hippocampal atrophy alongside hyperintensity in the white matter, mass matter, and basal ganglia. So, uh, this indicates that prolonged lower exposures may be associated with damage in similar areas to those observed in severely poisoned patients. In summary, the structural and functional changes to the vasculature observed in aging and cardiovascular disease, such as impaired vessel function of optimal cerebral blood flow and hypoperfusion and the age-related cerebral changes have all been associated with greater risk of early cognitive decline and dementia development. The so chronic exposure to low-level CO and the resultant accumulation of carboxyhemoglobin levels over time may further add to this burden, potentially accelerating damage particularly to ischemic sensitive areas. So therefore, older adults who are exposed to CO may be at an even greater risk of early cognitive decline and dementia development beyond that um, associated with ageing and disease, but currently this is unknown. These research findings present significant public health concerns, particularly to the older adult population. Um, not only due to increased susceptibility, but also the increased risk of home exposure due to retirement and possible restricted mobility. So recently, research has focused on risk reduction strategies in order to delay or prevent dementia by targeting the associated risk factors such as diabetes, physical inactivity, such social isolation, and recently air pollution. These later life risk factors are viewed as potentially modifiable, with a combined estimated percentage decrease of 18% in dementia prevalence. So potential risk factors for cognitive decline and dementia development, including CO, necessitate 
identification, which in turn may result in preventative measures and reduced reduced risk and cost. So increased increased understanding of the effects associated with chronic CO exposure and the direction of such effects at various concentrations is, is needed if we are to advance knowledge of the areas of which the at the levels of which these exposures present risk to health and neuropsychological function. The research uh, presented here makes a contribution to knowledge in the carbon monoxide uh, literature, providing evidence of the potential short-term and long-term effects of chronic exposure, but also contributes towards identifying patterns of impairment and the threshold at which these exposures become harmful to health in older adults. However, there is still a long way to go before models of impairment and thresholds of harm are identified and those most vulnerable are kept safe. Future research is needed to, in order to validate these findings. The research should be directed to ascertaining the level of dura duration at which the body's protective and potentially beneficial physiological responses become ineffective and harm is initiated. And this would assist in answering questions such as whether the reported beneficial beneficial positive effects are short lasting and subsequently result in impairment uh, given across all cognitive functions given sufficient uh, exposure time or time post exposure. Research that is focused on the specific cognitive areas that are affected by chronic low level CI um, is also needed and that examines the potential relationship between dementia development risk and CO exposure. So identifying safe exposure levels is vital in order to keep the public safe. And this information would be invaluable in informing policy, guidelines and safety technology. Um, in influencing the work of the fire service in preventing risk to older adults and to produce information for charities and health social care providers to protect, educate and improve awareness. And uh, it will provide it would provide information on possible patterns of impairment that would be invaluable in clinical clinical settings to aid in the diagnosis of low level CO exposure. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, or if you would like to contact me, feel free to send me an email at b.cheshire at lancaster.ac.uk. I'd like to thank the CO Research Trust again for funding the research and also all of the hard work from West Midlands Fire Service, especially Adrian and Bryn. Without you, this work would have been possible. So thank you. Thanks, Beth. Um, wow, that was a very, very detailed <laughs> um, presentation with lots and lots of inf interesting information in it. Um, I think for those of you who um, found that a lot to take in, we're going to make the video available on our website in the coming days. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to, to um, revisit that and perhaps go through it at a slightly slower pace. Um, so we've had a couple of questions in the, um, the, the, the chat. So what I'll do is I'll go through the questions one by one. I'll um, unmute the person who has asked the question and then um, we can we can um, we can we can have a discussion about that. Um, first person to have asked the question was uh, Stephanie Trotter from CO Gas Safety who um, is working with a lady called um, Karen Mallet, who sadly her parents died of CO in uh, February, 2021. Um, and she's, Stephanie's also made a point about the, the WHO guidelines for um, exposure to CO. Um, what I'll do is I'll unmute Stephanie now, and then she can ask her questions directly if that's okay. There we go, Stephanie, you're on mute, but if you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear you. Oh, 
Oh, there's two of you, Stephanie. What a treat. Um, let's see, hang on. There we go. Are you able to unmute yourself, Stephanie? Okay, perhaps if we, Stephanie, we'll come back to you. Um, can we have a bit of a technical challenge here? Um, okay. Um, the other question we had was from, well, from Chris Bilby, um, who is our GST, uh, sorry, CO Research Trust, old habits die hard, um, trustee. There we go, Chris. Um, you should be able to talk if you can unmute yourself. I'm not having very much luck here, am I? Oh, there we go. Hi, Beth. Hi, uh, Beth. The correlation between lack of servicing and the results you went through. Uh, servicing appliances? Yeah. Um, I haven't, uh, I have that data. Um, it's quite limited, though, of um, the last time they had their appliances um, serviced. But um, it's data that I have yet to analyse yet. Um, as you can tell from the presentation, there's so many re results. Um, and, and that's a, a, a condensed version, or tried to be. Um, so there is outstanding data that, um, that, that needs analysing. Um, that will have equally important um, impacts, I'm sure. Okay, Beth, thanks for that. Thanks, Chris. No problem. On that, did you, um, you collected data as well around sort of alarm ownership. And from what I remember when we've talked before, you, you collect, you, you've, collect, you've collected a whole wealth of sort of broader health related information. Oh. I know the focus of your PhD has largely been on cognitive function. And, 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 and around that part, I mean, did you, is there lots of health related data that, you know, places that, that cognitive function in the midst of a broader set of, of, of measures? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a lot more came out of the research than, than expected, um, sort of developing the analysis methods, um, which will be, I'm sure, um, transferable to other research areas as well. Um, I, you know, the, the data set is extensive, which is which is really good. Um, you know, carbon monoxide, like say ownership, um, types of properties, you know, you can look at kind of, um, you know, geographic regions, um, you know, the properties are, are really even spread um, across the, across Coventry. Um, so you can look at kind of road, um, you know, if, if it's coming from, uh, you know, sources from, from outdoor and road pollution, but, um, you know, the types of, the types of appliances that present the greatest risk. Um, I have run a few descriptive statistics um, on that data, um, and the results seem to suggest that um, the CO levels found in the homes is related to gas cookers, um, and further confirmed by the, um, primary heat, uh, primary cooking methods used by, um, you know, those that cook on gas basically have um, high CO levels. Um, so that kind of corroborates that finding um, that it's potentially more related to the gas, to gas cookers than uh, fires or the boiler. Um, so that, that there is a, you know, health related information. There's, um, you know, total physical diagnoses, for example, um, I've briefly looked at, at, at that part of the health data as well, which um, there's a possible association there between um, CO, increased CO exposure and um, greater number of physical diagnoses, um, which, you know, with the results that I'm finding, you, you, would, have, you would expect. So, um, I mean, the, the list goes on. There's a, a symptoms checklist. Um, there's... Um, of a range of about 20 common symptoms in uh, chronic exposure. So um, like I say, the, you could probably make another PhD out of the, <laughs> the, um, the data that's left, to be honest. Okay. I'm pretty sure you don't want to go around again, though. 
No. no. <laughs> I don't think um, I make it. <laughs> I've got lots of other questions that I'd like to ask. I haven't seen the presentation, but I'm quite, quite conscious that I don't want to hog the time we've got left. Um, Stephanie, I'll come back to you in a moment um, and we can we can we can finish with your questions and hopefully we'll be able to unmute you. Um, Laura from um, the All Party Parliamentary CO group um, had a question. So Laura, I'm gonna allow you to talk if you're able to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Right. Yes, we can. Hi, Laura. Success. Hello, how are you doing? Thanks very much for your presentation, Beth. That was really interesting and, yeah, incredibly um, sort of a lot of to take in. I've taken a few screenshots, so I can go back through some of the stuff later. Mm -hmm. My key question really was, um, and perhaps I'm sorry if, this, if, if you've sort of made this clear and I haven't picked up on it. When you went back and did the review... Mm -hmm. um, at the seven month point and you said that the sort of short term in positive impacts hadn't been sustained mm -hmm. was that that you compared to the kind of you know how how much they deteriorated and then they compared that with the lower level of exposure group or was it sort of on an individual basis the improvement hadn't been sustained if you so see that. I, yeah so it was um a correlational sort of design study so um, the how I analyzed it was the exposure at time at the first time point it's really confusing time one time two um, and I appreciate that I've you know put a load of results in there um, so the exposure at the first time period um, was associated with the positive effects um, so that's at least a month's exposure so it's you know you, because the the CO levels weren't monitored in the seven months between um, monitoring periods, you know, it, you're running, it's, you don't really know whether that person's exposure was continuous throughout the whole nine months or whether there was, um, after that one month of measurement, it, it ended. So that's why it's difficult to say whether the effects result sort of um, after given sufficient exposure, like continuous exposure time, or whether they result um, given sufficient time post exposure once it ceased. Um, but the positive, let's say, short lasting effects at time one um, weren't present at, at time two in the sense that the if you, if if it was a genuine if it was a sort of a, a strong finding you would maybe expect the one month exposure at time two to be also associated with the same positive effects. Um, but I think there was six cognitive functions at time one that were positively affected and three of them are now showing negative effects um, with the, so because you can look at the, on the cognitive function at seven months, you, um, I looked at the time one exposure yeah. to see if that was still having an impact at seven months. Um, and then positive effects, like I say, had gone, neither were they present with the, the second month's exposure um, and you know moreover they had kind of switched to uh, longer term negative impacts I mean like I say whether the, the longer term um, effects result from um, time sufficient exposure time if it was continuous or whether that they result from um, given time post after the exposure stopped um, that's very difficult to you know with observational yeah. studies you can't really unless you were to measure um the CO levels for a year um, yeah I, I guess I guess what I'm really asking is with the in the individuals where there were great higher levels of CO did they mm -hmm. get were they getting worse more than the individuals with lower levels of CO does that make sense was the sort of deterioration more significant yes yes okay. particularly when Thanks. age um it, it is considered as well yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Can I just possibly ask a very brief other question, which is you mentioned inhibition as a factor that you were measuring. I don't know what that is. Is it some, could you possibly ex explain it? Um, so there's a few different types of inhibition. There's behavioural inhibition. So um, being conscious of and aware of what you, you, you're you saying, um, if that makes sense, you have to inhibit um, your behaviour to not or accept people and, and that sort of thing. So that's behavioral um, inhibition. Then you have um, like prepotent response. So um, in certain reaction time tasks, for example, there's a green light or there's a red light and you have to press 
uh, the space bar for the green light, but not the red light. Um, and because there's not many green lights, people kind of get into the pattern of just keep pressing the space bar because it's quite quick. Uh-huh. Um, but you have to inhibit that prepotent response and not respond when it's red. So that can be quite difficult. Thank um, you very much. For some people. Great. Um, I'm quite conscious of time now, and I want to give Stephanie an, an opportunity to ask her question. Um, so thank you, Laura. I'm going to mute you, if that's okay. Please don't take it personally. Um, and then Stephanie, let's um, see whether you're able to, to unmute. Um, okay. Doesn't seem to be working. So what I'll do is I will... I'll read out Stephanie's message. Um, as part of the work that, St- that, that CO Gas Safety are doing, they've been working with a lady called Karen Mallet, who's age 41, whose parents died of CO in February 2021. Karen's parents were Mary and Terry Mallet from Red Ruth in Cornwall. Before their death, they experienced mental and cognitive de- decline and were assessed. Their results showed deterioration. Unfortunately, there were no other further investigations. Karen says, It's a shame that dementia care professionals don't seem aware of the link either. Perhaps if they did, they could raise the relevant questions, which could lead to either tracking the source or to rule out of the equation. It could save the NHS a lot of money, but most importantly, it could save lives. Um, Which I think, you know, Karen's comment there really sums up why you're doing the the, the research here. Um, Further down here. Oh, Stephanie, have you managed to unmute? Well, uh, have I? Are are you hearing me? Yeah, oh, I can hear you loud and clear. So Brilliant. Just, Thanks I've, so much. I've just um, mentioned Karen's point. So did you want to expand on that and then perhaps cover off the point you make about the, the WHO guidelines? I never asked, like to ask you to be brief, Stephanie, but if you could, that'd be super because we're running over time here. Well, yeah. the WHO, WHO guidelines have been changed very recently, as you probably are all well aware, and it's four parts per million for 24 hours. Mm. Our concern is that survivors, people who or people who think they're being poisoned, can't obtain a test of the air in their in their homes to find out what the level is. And we, I mean, the research you've done, Beth, is fantastic, but we've always mm-hmm. said we know that carbon monoxide isn't good for you. So why don't we concentrate on stopping it in the first place? Mm -hmm. No, no, I I definitely agree with you. I think um, as um, Adrian mentioned, it's kind of why I'm trying to push research in the area um, because it still appears that not only the public, but medical professionals um, are quite um, unaware of, um, you know, CO exposure and potential um, accidental uh, poisonings. Um, And with the CO alarms as well, um, obviously they don't alert to lower levels or chronic exposure. Um, I think um, maybe Honeywell and a few others, they do the um, ventilate um, function um, and I know fire angel have ones where you can actually see the level um, but you're not going to sit there and watch it the whole time I suppose so um, you know the the alarms the current alarm um, levels standards are, are considerably higher than the level CO levels that I've observed in the research that I've undertaken and obviously there's you know possible you know negative effects there so um, at extremely lower levels than the current threshold. So I think, you know, the move forward, we kind of need to be looking at identifying thresholds of harm um, for susceptible groups like older adults where the levels are probably going to be lower and um, shorter durations. Um, and then you can kind of work towards, um, you know, changing CO alarm um, levels that they trigger at so that you're keeping um, people safe. Thanks Beth, no I agree with you completely and in fact I tend to say that CO alarms are brilliant at preventing death but they are not health monitors and that's the best way I think of understanding them quickly Um, but our point really is that 
if only there was some kind of free test where people came to relight the gas appliances and test the air, the CO. There isn't. I can't even get at the moment qualified gas investigators to investigate people who and their appliances when they think they have been poisoned. Mm -hmm. And it's great that you're doing your research, but while you're doing it into the very minute amount of CO, people are being poisoned by much larger amounts. And I just find that so frustrating that we can't mm -hmm. help them. And, and you're so right about what you say about the medics. I have had a recent case where the medics, to put it as she told me, the medics just thought we were making it all up, although they'd had a CO alarm alarming. So they were at quite high levels. Right. Yeah, it's, I think, you know, campaigns, media campaigns and, and that sort of thing to raise awareness, um, you know, not, not only to medical professionals, but also to um, charities and social and domestic um, care providers um, to protect older adults and, and advise would, would also, I think there's a, gen, like a, uh, a general lack of awareness um, of CO. Um, poisoning but I suppose the problem if you suspect high um, CO within your home not being able to have somebody come out to check the readings for you um, is, is frustrating I, I understand that but I suppose that one of the problems with that is um, so I tested the ambient CO level um, every time I went to a property and all properties except for one um, showed a reading whilst I was there of zero parts per million um, so taking an instantaneous reading um, you know it potentially would come back as zero and then you don't think there's a problem um, but when you look at like on the slides where you've got them, the, the CO levels over the month you can clearly see that it's fluctuating um, and up to sort of 29 parts per million um, so I don't think it's an accurate representation of, of what's happening in the home and CO levels. Um, just kind of taking that one one reading, um, it would be more beneficial to have um, a, a data logger in place or something for a week, or uh, you know, to, well, to kind of look at them. I, the I agree. I th I see your point in completely, Beth, and I agree with you. But I think what I'm thinking of is much higher levels, mm -hmm. which is. The sharp end, if you like, it's the end that we need to start at. And I agree that if no CO is found and people have been reporting symptoms or you're worried, it would be great if a monitor was left. And I couldn't agree more. It could just be for a week or a month. So how are is there anyone listening who could suggest who might do this? I mean, I can suggest somebody, but nobody seems willing to make these people do it and what i really want is people to get together and ask hse to make the gas emergency service do that just that go in relight test if they don't find anything but they think there might be something wrong leave a monitor and come back in say a week and then a month yes, so that would be fantastic i, I think that, yeah I, I agree i think that's a very very important point but i think that's a a broader discussion that we should we should we should pick up um, another time and look at what what technologies out there can be used for exactly that purpose. Um, so well, ACO you know. has some technology, and as you said, Beth, the the digital ones they yeah. might help. But um, we'll still need someone to come in and find the actual source. That's the problem, Adrian. Yeah, and there isn't anyone at the moment. Why not? I've been bleating about this since 1995. I think there has been some um, positive steps in the right direction. Um, I don't know if Bryn's still on the call, um, if, if he logged on, but um, I know he's been doing some really good work with West Midlands Fire Service um, and pushing um, their safe and well visits um, the the, um, pa the the paperwork had the CO questions on there. Have you taken CO level? What is it? Um, and, and and you know there's I think there's about four questions relating to CO on there. Um, but before it was kind of optional if you build it in or not. But Bryn's been pushing for a long time to have that as um, a mandatory part of 
the safe and well visits where um, before when you came back and you went to the information on the system, you could skip them questions, but now um, you have to input something. So it has become a mandatory part of um, their safe and well visits, which is a, um, well, I think it's a, it's a great leap in, in the right direction, really. Brilliant. Okay, I'm quite conscious of time here that we've run over by 10 minutes. So if it's okay, I'll wrap up now, um, if, that, if people don't mind. Um, thank you, Stephanie, for, for, for your contribution as ever. Um, so all that's left for me really to do is to say thanks to Beth for the presentation. Thanks to everybody who's attended. And just to let you know that we have another lecture next month, and it'll be James Hanlon from the Institute of Occupational Medicine who will be um, launching uh, a review of the solid fuel industry in the context of CO. Um, he's produced a report which will be published on the 25th of November. Um, following on for that on the 1st of December, we are working with the National CO Awareness Association, the International CO Research Network, and the National Ch Fire Chiefs Council um, on a workshop for firefighters, um, looking at best practice in the US and in the UK and uh, in Canada. Um, and that, that that's aimed specifically at firefighters looking at the research that's been carried out, education and awareness. Um, and then on the 16th of December, we've got Professor Heather Jarman from St George's Tootin, who will be presenting on the emergency department study. Um, her presentation is uh, emergency department's first line of defence against CO exposure. So we've got lots of things coming up now and we will be having uh, further lectures in the new year. Um, so I think with much, without much further ado, I think now is the time for me to, to thank everybody and hope that you have a nice evening. Um, and all this information will be available on our website, um, if not today, first thing tomorrow morning. Beth has kindly also produced a blog which will be on the website, which will summarise the project you know, uh, in, in a shorter form. So thank you, everybody.